in a world where everyone is looking for your money up front, doesn't it just make sense to check out a podcast that's looking to give you something for free? Like the music for your content and free music for your film and videos? Look no further. It's the Tim Kulig Free Music Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Tim Kulig Free Music Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Kulig. This week is episode 11, entitled Imposter Syndrome. Now, you've probably heard this somewhere, maybe even experienced it unknowingly, <laughs> but it's truly a real demotivator. Um, what is it anyways? What What is imposter syndrome? Well, two clinical psychologists, a woman by the name of Pauline Rose Clance and another woman by the name of Suzanne Imes, identified this phenomenon back in 1978, and their definition of it is as such. Imposter syndrome is the condition of feeling anxious and not experiencing success internally, despite being high-performing in external objective ways. This condition offered, often results in people feeling like a fraud, a phony, and doubting their abilities. Now, I can tell you right off the cuff that there's been plenty of times in my career, in my life, in my creative endeavors, what have you, where I've had this feeling, this overwhelming sensation of like, oh man, like something's coming too easy or something, something transpires and I feel like I don't know everything I need to know about it. I need to know 100%, 100%. And I only know like 85%. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get found out. I'm a fraud. I don't know enough about what I'm doing. And people are going to think that I'm not an expert. This is all garbage. You know, this whole feeling like being a fraud, feeling like you don't deserve what you have, what you've accomplished. Though These are, these are just empty feelings associated with a, a misguided feeling of insecurity and basically it's this the feeling that like you don't deserve what you have and that's garbage it's total garbage it, you things come so easily for somebody that practices things long enough if you've been writing music for 30 years things just happen you just the workflow just flows if you've been doing accounting and taxation you know taxes for people for 30 40 years it's really easy to be like well this comes so easily and so naturally to me it's so I almost feel like a fraud because you know I'm getting paid to do something that I, everybody must know how to do that's the key though is that everybody doesn't know what you're doing and doesn't understand what you're doing so you know that that feeling like because something comes so naturally it somehow diminishes the value of what you do what you offer or what you create uh, even feeling anxious like just just feeling anxious about what you're doing and the job you're doing or the job you feel like you're not doing, uh, that's not feeling success internally, even though you're killing it, man, it's a real buzzkill. It's a real buzzkill. And, and so this week, I thought I'd dive into this a little bit. And I've got some show notes at the end. So if you want to, you know, if you're watching this on or listen to this rather on Podbean or anywhere else, there's there's URL links in there. You can go to listen to I actually the main the main article I use for this particular podcast is uh, one from BetterHelp I think it was but there's a couple other resources out there too. So I mean let's let's think about this for a second. Isn't it good to question your adequacy on things? Well, well yeah, of course it is. Of course it's good to think, you know, hey, do I know what the hell I'm talking about? Do I know what I'm doing? You know, am I adding real value? Um, but there's a difference. Humility is knowing you don't know everything. I don't know everything. I, I barely understand a ton of theory when it comes to music. You know, if you want to dive into like modes and like really deep core things about music theory, it's just something that's eluded me. I ended up switching gears and ear training earlier on in my musical career. And from then on, I literally just wrote from feel. So a lot of the stuff that comes out of me may not have a lot of significance or a lot of ties to traditional music theory, but that's kind of what makes my music so unique. And I'm fine with that. I've learned over the years to accept the fact that I'm never going to be a classical, you know, pianist or classical composer. 
And I don't want to be. That's that's not the purpose of why I create music. But, you know, hum- humility, your limitations, you know, in a complex si- situation, like, you know what's going on. You know that, like, oh, man, like, I've never gotten to this level in accounting or I've never I've never had to deal with this situation but like maybe you know where to get the answers from and that's fine you're humble you're hum- you have humility that you don't have all the answers and you know where to go to get it the difference with imposter syndrome is that um, inadequacy is a feeling of being incapable of doing something when you're totally competent to do so this is often the result of assessing yourself and not the situation and having a comparison issue, you know, often with people you don't know that have decades more experience than you. So it's completely unfair to have that kind of assessment of yourself in any situation where you have a limited amount of resource and experience, and yet you're comparing yourself to somebody that's 20, 30, 40 years your senior on some experience, right? Also a feeling of like time is running out. It's only a matter of time. They're all going to figure out. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I can't keep doing it at the same rate as I used to. So I must be a fraud or I must not know what the heck I'm doing. You know, um, ashamed that I don't have the answers or don't have the drive I used to. And just ultimately people with this syndrome tend to withdraw and hide, you know, as a result and ultimately create like this self-fulfilling prophecy. You were fine. You had no issues whatsoever with understanding what you were doing and and what you wanted to accomplish. And you have the skill set. You know what you're doing. It's not perfect all the time. Nobody's perfect. That's just it. It's this level of perfection that imposter syndrome folks or people that are suffering from imposter syndrome have. And some of these root causes will help will help root that out. So root causes. Um one of the big ones are the cognitive distortions that people experience. Self-doubt, often unwarranted in light of high achievement and high achiever mentality. Look, I personally go through this all the time. I'm always looking to try to like be everything I can, put as much effort and as much emphasis into anything I'm doing and give it my 100% all the time. And it's just not sustainable. It's not possible. You know, sometimes good enough is good enough, you know? And self-doubt, often unwarranted in light of this high achievement, it comes from a couple different places. Sometimes it comes from, like, a family environment of perfectionism where even, you know, getting an A is, it should be, that should be wonderful, but it's like, oh, you got a low A or you got, you know... Or you've got a series of, of things that are just, just re- unreasonable expectations for constant high-level achievement from some family influences and, and family, family criticisms. It could also be social pressures, you know? You know, feeling of being cast out for failure or, or just not achieving. Also, a sense of belonging, a fear of exclusion for not meeting expectations, and finally, a personality, you just could be your personality, you know, internalizing feelings of pressure, doubt and failure. I mean, we often we tell these ourselves these stories, but they're just stories. You know, I, like we hold ourselves to these high esteems or these stories in our head. Like if I don't do X, Y and Z by the time I'm this age, then I'm a failure. Well, says who says who, you know, what was it? Uh, Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken failed dozens of businesses, had like three or four failed marriages, and with his first two social security checks at 55, sold everything, got into a a station wagon and traveled around the country until somebody took his his recipe and KFC was born. He basically just took a cut, you know, a percentage of their profits for sharing his recipe. I mean, the guy was in his golden years. He was ready to retire and he had done a bunch of things that had failed. Yet he still achieved. So it doesn't like the, the, these paradigms that we stand by and we get all worked up about and all worried. It's garbage. It's it's complete garbage. Stupid stories we have in our head. Also, you know, rumination is negative and self-destructive. We sit there and we again, it, it, it spawns off of stories, but it really has to do with sitting there and beating ourselves up in our heads for choices we made or 
even more importantly, choices we we neglected to make are things where we missed the mark. And we really sit there and we just lambast ourselves and beat ourselves up in the head. And it's it's bad language. It's it's bad self-talk. And that self-talk just really needs to be redirected into a more constructive review of something that you didn't enjoy about something you were trying to accomplish. You know, sit there and, and analyze the things that you liked and the things you didn't like. And the things you didn't like, well, figure out how next time you can get it done better. You know, and finally, anxiety that leads to shame, depression, and decreased level of self-confidence and self-worth. That, that'll just perpetuate that, that self-talk and that destructive self-talk will just lead to all that. And you'll just ruminate and spin in a circle and constantly feel like you're not enough and you're not good enough. So again, revisiting these cognitive distortions is a really good way to try to like figure out what it is that you didn't like about something and just make moves and decisions to fix it going forward. That's it. So what are some characteristics specific to the imposter syndrome, right? Well, first and foremost, you've got self-doubt. Ultimately, <laughs> that's all about, geez, do I know what I think I know? Do I know enough? Do I know anything? You know, all these feelings and all these thoughts really culminate that feeling of the imposter syndrome. Also, undervaluing contributions, you know, marginalizing one's own abilities and successes. You know, it's, you never had that conversation with a friend or a coworker, and you get some praise. And the first thing you do is, is to try to marginalize or minimize what you've done instead of just saying thank you. Well, you should still, you should say freaking thank you is what you should do. You should literally just accept the praise and appreciate that somebody's looking at what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing. Also, self-deprecating talk and, di and inner dialogue um, when normally a person would celebrate. Like that's, it's on the same level. So you really, you really have to watch out for that. I mean, th those two signs are really strong signs that, you know, you feel like you have some level of, of imposter syndrome going on. Uh, attributing your success, some of your successes or all of your success to external factors like luck or some chance event, maybe other coworkers or flat out a fluke. Like, ah, I just got real lucky and this is a fluke and this will probably never happen again. Another garbage thought. It's that's not the case at all. You're again, marginalizing and diminishing your own value. Um, there's also self-sabotage. Ooh, this is the worst. You know, fear of success. So what do you do? You put off what you're doing. You, you, uh, you know, you procrastinate. You put off what you're doing. You don't do as good a job because you think you can't do a good job. Psyching yourself out of any achievements. You know, just literally just freaking worrying and ruminating to the point where now you can't perform because you've basically left yourself incapable of moving forward and <laughs> that ends up creating like a less effort and attention to the root cause and the root the root problem at hand uh because you feel you can't do it and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so yeah that sabotage that sabotage just can literally create you to be incompetent and to be basically you know <laughs> the personification of this imposter syndrome, you know, uh, another one, this is huge setting unrealistic expectations. Look, anything you try to achieve in life, you need to chunk and then you need to micromanage the micro details of the process that involves you, involves you getting from point A to point B, right? And some of these tasks are extreme. I mean, if you were looking to put on, say, you know, 30, 40 pounds of muscle mass and become, you know, a bodybuilder, that just doesn't happen overnight. And a huge paradigm shift has to happen in your life and the way that you eat and the way that you train and how it wraps around the rest of your social and your work and your physiology, like all that, all that is super important. And but to expect that to happen in the course of a week is just it's an unrealistic expectation. And 
<laughs> shocker, you're going to miss those goals because they're unrealistic and you're going to feel like a failure. And it's you had already set yourself up for failure because those goals were completely unachievable. You know, continuous fear of not living up to those expectations. Again, they're unrealistic. Uh, it's a burden instead of a challenge. I mean, that's like that internal language is super important. Like nothing in life should be treated as a burden. It should be a challenge. When it's a challenge, it's like you're gamifying your life. Okay. So gamify your life, create challenges. Try not to use negative language when it comes to the things that you want to accomplish. Because the second you do that, you start thinking about why you can't do something as opposed to why you can. So language is incredibly important and super helpful. And finally, you know, with on, on continuous fear and not living up to expectations, allowing others to set the bar for you achieving goals and successes. I found when I share some of the things that I want to do and accomplish with my career, with my art, and somebody overshares back about what their definition is for success, I have to be cautious because You've got to listen, but, you know, listen with, yeah, you know, with an open mind and with the understanding that the person is more, more than likely than not trying to help, but, you know, it's just talk and you can take whatever you want and you can leave whatever you want on the table. That's fine. But ultimately nobody else sets the bar for what achieving goals for you and what your successes are. You do. Uh, finally, burnout. I mean, burnout will push you to feeling like you are completely an imposter because you push so hard to achieve from the sense of inadequacy. It diminishes the passion you have for the work that you're looking to do. It turns it into a chore and the meaning and purpose of what you were doing all along is lost to exhaustion. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. So what are some of the types of imposter syndrome that could exist because everything I've said so far indicates that there's a couple different ways this can go. So the article I read had several different imposter syndrome, you know, subcategories. The first one being the perfectionist, you know, the feeling that whatever you do, it's never good enough. And you're always improving and micromanaging things to death. And the fear under all of that is kind of losing control of what you're doing, what you're creating, what you're trying to accomplish. Now, as a musician, I can tell you this, you know, a, per a musician can get lost in the minutia of micromanaging and, you know, micro improving a piece to the point where they destroy any and all feeling that they had when they initially captured the notes and you know, the feeling that made them happy about what they were writing. So I find myself getting to a certain point with a piece and realizing even subconsciously, I'm about to destroy this. I need to stop. So, <laughs> so I think I've gotten past that perfectionist imposter thing because at some point you have to push, move on and move on to the next project. Um, the other version is the superwoman man person, um, that the idea that you need to prove you're capable of anything and that you can sacrifice your personal time to show commitment, effort, the fear underlying all that is, you know, free times taking away from work goals and achievement. Look, <laughs> the, <laughs> there's, there's, you know, entire graveyards full of people that wish they had more time, right? Or wish they had done A, B, C, D, and E, right? And nobody remembers that you stuck around for that late night on a Friday instead of going home and seeing your friends and family, right? Enough, you know, move on. It, it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? Also, another category, the natural genius. This is somebody, like, that seems like everything seems to fall into place and come easy to them the first time they try something, whether it's sports or something at work or something they're creating, like it just, it just clicks, right? All the time. And the idea that going back and reworking something is a fail for these type of people is just a complete misnomer. It's garbage. It's, it's, it just means it's some skill set that they haven't had time or the space to practice yet. And 
they're having this internal dialogue and this definition that they're a failure at it, when in fact, they're actually in the best position ever because they're learning something new. So they're creating new neural pathways and this this should be something you embrace and you're excited about. Not, not you know, um, like upset and, you know, fearful and ashamed of. Um, also, feedback, critique, rework are threatening and demoralizing. So when somebody looks at your stuff and has a critical mindset or a critical eye on what you're doing, trying to help you, you have a different feedback and a different feeling about it in that it's demoralizing you and the critique critique and feedback just doesn't do the thing. In fact, it, it, it hinders you. It kind of paralyzes you, which is not good. And it all comes from the fear of shame of failing or of being inadequate for the task. And guess what? We don't always know everything. And that's fine. That's completely fine. The soloist. (laughs) That person that's unwilling to ask for help. And God forbid you ask them if they need any help. They'll give you a big attitude and they'll push you back and everything else. They don't want to, because they don't want to risk exposing, they don't know what to do or aren't as skilled at something as... They think other people perceive them. Look, we have this weird thing where we think everybody's thinking about us all the time. It's complete BS. (laughs) 99% of the time, people could care less about us, okay? And really, this, this fear, this soloist fear, comes from a shame in asking for help and a fear of being seen as incompetent. You know, asking for help is incredibly empowering if you show somebody in that ask that you see them as an authority and as um, a resource to get you where you want to be with a task at hand. So like, that's just like, that just creates bonds. And by not having that, and by having this soloist attitude, you literally just break the ability to connect with another human being. So don't do that. The expert the guy, the person that needs to know all the answers, angles before taking on the job, like everything, 100%. <laughs> They're not sharing details to help better understand the task at hand. This fear, again, comes back down to inadequacy, inac- inadequacy, not being an expert, and not nearly, nearly as much as perceived by the people around them. That's okay. That's fine. A lot of times, you know, a decent person at their job knows far more about that subject matter than somebody that does a completely different type of job. And to them, they're amazing because they're like, I don't deal with this every day. And I have some accounting knowledge that I consider to be pretty pedestrian, you know, like just very simple and and straightforward, but it's not anything that people normally in a day-to-day environment gravitate towards. So when I tell them, a couple of tricks or a couple of things. I don't want to say tricks, but you know, like th- there's a couple of tax laws or whatever that you can save money with, you can save taxes on, and there's, you know, it's completely legitimate and everything else. People are just like, wow, you're really knowledgeable. Like, well, yeah, then I, you know, I could easily fall into this category and be like, well, I, you know, I, it's, it's really nothing. Well, it's not nothing. It take, took me years to learn some of these skills and some of these techniques. And, yeah, it has a value. Clearly it does, because if somebody responds that way, they see the value in it. Uh, the last two here are the noticer and the discounter. Noticer is, you know, forgiving of others, but not self and that my own ability and shortcomings and super hyper aware of the competition and secretly feeling like, you know, I missed that bar. Look, you compare yourself to somebody that's been doing something for far longer. You are going to feel emotionally and career wise in the toilet. If you know, I'm on this journey to produce two to 3000 songs over the next decade. And if I was going to sit here and compare myself to like a Burt Bacharach who wrote tons of music for other people and himself or Kevin McLeod, who's got a 2,500 plus song catalog out there, but started in the nineties you know, to c- compare myself to that is completely invalid and unrealistic. It's an unrealistic self-view. And 
it's like a fear of not belonging or not deserving something when you haven't even put in, you know, five, 10, 15% of the effort of the peer or the person that you're aspiring to become or aspiring to, to mirror and mimic that behavior, right? Now, a discounter rationalizes away their own competence or skill set. They'll literally say, anyone could have done this. And the fear is that there's, you, you never know enough, right? You never know enough about a subject to feel like you have competence. And it's just wrong. I mean, from day one, when you're studying a subject, you begin to build competence and confidence in the understanding and knowing of that skill set. So take the time to do that and celebrate those milestones and those stepping stones of your learning process and stop doing it because that's it's all about comparison. A lot of this stuff is all about comparison. You're comparing yourself to somebody that's been doing something for years and make it look super easy and it's easy to them because it's just in their blood at this point. They It, it becomes so naturally because it's just something they practice so much that they're highly skilled at it. And you are too. If you've been at something for 10, 20, 30 years and you're really good at it and things just come naturally and people they come to you and you're the go-to, guess what? You've arrived. You figured it out. You figured out how to do this thing and you're great at it. So don't discount it and don't diffuse your expertise. So we briefly talked about causes, characteristics, and types of imposter syndrome, which is great and all, but how the heck do we deal with all this, right? Well, there's a few tips I've got for you, as well as a technique. Um, first, the technique, the SBNRR technique, which is stop, breathe, notice, reflect, and respond help you slow down and consider the situation at hand. Your own thoughts, your feelings, reactions, all of that more mindfully, okay? So first, you stop allowing yourself to stop in your tracks and take a moment to pause, okay? Pause for a second. What exactly are you thinking or are you feeling? You know, is it rational? Are you just worried for some unfounded reason? Are you playing a story throughout your head? Stop for a second and think about it. Second, breathe. Give yourself a deep breath and let your thoughts go and don't be attached to them. Most of the time, our head's a jerk, okay? It just, if you leave it alone and leave it to its own devices, it's going to start filling in the blanks about everything in your world and in your universe and your worldview. And it's going to drive you freaking nuts. I mean, it does for me. Maybe I'm nuts. But the point being is that an idle mind will just randomly have thoughts. And these thoughts don't mean anything. And if you start attaching meaning and feelings and emotions to them, in like in this case, you know, stopping and breathing for a second is a really good way to try to halter some of that. And take notice. Notice those feelings. Your body, your surroundings, your peers, the situation you're in, how you're reacting, anything else that you can notice. What exactly is happening? And are you being reactive for other reasons? Sometimes I feel this imposter syndrome because I'm freaking hungry, right? It has nothing to do with any other reality other than the fact that I've skipped a meal and at this point I feel inadequate about something and I feel like I should be able to do something and it's not working out and it's because I'm not firing on all cylinders because I forgot to eat lunch. And that's just dumb. Stop what you're doing. Grab yourself a bite to eat. Take that break. Come back to it. 99% of the time it's going to be fine. So stop it. <laughs> You know, once you've noticed what's going on, reassess, evaluate the situation and the reason you felt a need to fall into the imposter syndrome. Like, why, why the hell did you fall there? I mean, in this case, what I just said, it's because I needed to freaking eat, you know, in other cases, it could just be that you made a mistake that you felt was so dumb and, and pedestrian and such a novice freaking mistake that you're like, shit, maybe I don't know anything. <laughs> I've, I've had those where I'm like, how did I make that mistake? How did I do that? Guess what? You're human. 
You're totally human. You have good days and bad days. Sometimes you forget even the most, you know, rudimentary, simple thing about a task or a skill set or whatever you have, and it's okay. Relax. Forgive yourself. <laughs> but ultimately, after you've gone through this process of stopping, breathing, noticing, and reassessing, respond and react with intention. It can be more informed and composed now that you have calmed yourself a bit. So just take the moment and the time to assess the situation and understand what you're looking at and then take action and move forward. And oftentimes you'll eliminate or at least minimize to a point where it's very tolerable this situation of imposter syndrome. So here's a great list from the BetterHelp article that I was reading on 10 tips for dealing with your imposter syndrome and struggling with any version of feeling like that. And the first one is understand the voice, you know, understand the voice in your head and the different saboteur voices that keep you from advancing. Okay. Uh, number two, assess the evidence, make a simple two column list. You know, this is sometimes one of the easiest ways to figure out what the hell's going on in your life. You know, Evidence that I'm inadequate on one side, evidence that I'm competent on the other. Bring some perspective. You know, you may find that there's some areas that you're lacking in, but you're going to find also that you're far more competent than you give yourself credit for. So give yourself that chance and give yourself that focus and, and review. Uh, also refocus on values. Uh, take your focus away from outward signs of success or achievement and remind yourself what really matters to you, man? You know, what, what's, what is really important to you? Reframe your thoughts and your feelings around growth. Life and your career and your relationships are a journey. You can't grow, learn, create, make progress without stretching yourself. And stretching is hard, okay? Stretching is hard. Growing is hard. Every big journey starts with the first few steps. Okay. Number five, get out of your head. Again, rumination, you know, cycling through thoughts. It goes hand in hand with imposter syndrome. Find somebody to talk to or write down your fears. They are less powerful when they aren't circling. And they're far less powerful when someone else gives you perspective. I often reach out to my best friend, Tom Seymour, when I'm feeling like there's something awry or amiss in what I'm doing musically. And he'll oftentimes just verbally give me a slap in the face. Of course, you know, from a place of love and caring and, and best friendmanship, <laughs> if that's even a word. But he often comes to me, he's like, dude, you're killing it. Listen, you're doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You're doing all these things and you're accomplishing all this stuff. You're getting a lot done. So, so what if one day you only hit three or four marks? So a lot of people go days without going towards their goal. A lot of people never try to go towards their goals because they're just incapable of taking that first step. So get out of your head. Stop ruminating about that stuff. And that goes like hand in hand with number six here. Practice self-compassion. Listen, don't beat yourself up for feeling like a fraud. It's okay. <laughs> there must be something in there that's making you feel like, hey, I could probably do this better. Um, you know, where's that inadequacy and doubt coming from? You know, give yourself that credit and compassion for how far you've come, but also, you know, treat it as good information. Now, obviously, there's something there that makes you want to go into a rumination place, but go to a place of gratitude first and then build off of that and say, okay, there's clearly somewhere in here I want to improve. And that's good. That's, that's constructive and that's fine. But let's, let's look at it from a very constructive perspective. At seven, be kind to yourself. You are a human and we make mistakes. Okay. Even computer systems make mistakes and we program to be program them to be infallible. Um, <laughs> but all humans make mistakes. You will too, no matter how incredibly good you are at something. Practicing self-compassion will help tame that inner critic and help stop you from ruminating over the things that you didn't do right, 
that you failed at, that you just didn't accomplish, you just didn't know, you didn't have the answer right away. That's, these are unrealistic expectations for you. And just give yourself a break. And number eight, keep your failures in perspective. You know, I, write down the likely outcomes if some part of your effort fails. Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? You know, is it really going to be the end of the world? Probably not. Most decisions and most things we do in life are really inconsequential in the grand, grand scheme of things. So use it as a learning tool. Instead of beating yourself up, try learning from your failures instead of letting your failures define you. You are not defined by your inability to have gotten to work on time twice this week. That's not the point of existence to destroy yourself for making a couple of um, faux pas or, or saying the wrong thing. Like, don't worry about it. Just make an effort and put a line in the sand that you're going to improve going forward. And that's it. Practice mindfulness. Number nine, use that SBNRR. It's really hard to say. And, and, you know, if you go to that article, it's a little easier to, <laughs> to understand that. I really wish they had used some other kind of... <laughs> Some other kind of like mnemonic expression. It's just awful, awful. Uh, but use that technique to pause and reevaluate. Um, gives you an op opportunity to, you know, bring yourself back to the present and, um, you know, have a reflection on, you know, what is actually happening and being mindful of the present and being mindful of who you are um, at this point in life. And remember this, the present's all we got. When you ruminate, over the past, you know, you're dealing with things that can't be changed and you're dealing with things that have already happened. And the best you can do, the best you can do is learn from those experiences and improve upon them going forward in, in, the, per, in the current moment in real time. And when you ruminate or concern yourself or have anxiety about the future, and again, depression comes from ruminating over the past. And anxiety comes from ruminating over what could happen in the future. Again, stories, because none of that shit is real until it actually happens. So, you know, worrying about the future is just unneeded and unnecessary anxiety. There's a difference. There's a difference between ruminating over the future and having anxiety about it and preparing for possible outcomes from a intellectual and preparedness perspective. Very different things right? One allows you to spin in circles and just freak out about every little thing. And the other one is a tactical, planned, thought out, well, well thought out and well documented way of handling various things as they come to pass. Okay. And finally, number 10, seek trusted feedback from your network. Again, like when I reach out to my friend, Tom Seymour, um, make it a practice to periodically get feedback from people you trust and respect. Now, understanding that select that network carefully or at the very least give definition to people when you're reaching out like that specifically about, hey, listen, I'm going to I want some feedback on this and I'm looking for constructive feedback and you know, make sure that the that person has some tact and and in a way that they can talk to you that is meaningful and um, and is is a reflection of what people would have as a response to what you were doing and what you did and the outcomes that happened. OK, um, you, you want somebody to talk to you in a way that's not going to try to destroy you. You want them to lift you up. So, you know, choose choose that review network carefully and cautiously. Uh, but if you've got close friends or close colleagues that are that are really good about giving that kind of feedback, you know who they are and gravitate towards them for answers to this kind of thing. You know, ultimately acknowledging the existence of imposter syndrome uh, is the beginning of a journey on a road to everlasting happiness in your career, your relationships, everything, everything. So take the time to evaluate Read some of these articles and check them out further. If you feel like this is something that you battle with, with your career, with your creative endeavors, creativity online, as you know, 
uh, as a social media person, as a social media creator and a content creator or whatever it is you do in life. You know, if any of these things, even one piece of this resonated, take a look at this week's references and resources, uh, read into them and give them an opportunity to help you better manage that self-talk because that self-talk is so destructive and it keeps you from attaining and achieving your goals and your goals. I mean, nobody's, nobody's dragging your hand to the finish line. I mean, I, not in my life does that happen. And I think most people, most people on this planet have to be their own cheerleader first. And you have to, you have to bring yourself to the table. You have to bring yourself to the work. And, and it's only you, it's only you in your head. And if your inner dialogue and your inner, inner narrative is suffering from any of these, then it's time to evaluate and assess for yourself different ways of talking to yourself so that you can motivate without demotivating yourself into an imposter syndrome cycle of rumination and um, circular arguments with yourself that ultimately keeps you from creating the life that you want. Everybody, I'm so glad you came back for the 11th episode. It's been really interesting to research this, and I find that, you know, again, it's another subject that I feel like I've just touched the surface. It'll probably be one that comes back to haunt me later on again, especially if I have an experience. Like, I feel like some of the episodes in the future are going to be like, not panic episodes, but they'll be like, they'll be like real time experiences where I'm like, oh, this happened to me and I really want to capture my feelings about this because I feel like it's very authentic and pure and it may be something that somebody else is going through. And uh, I just want them to know that it's, you're not alone, man. You know, this is, this journey is complicated, but there's tools and there's resources and you're, you're alike everybody else more than you think all right thanks for checking in again with me and thanks again for listening to the tim kulig free music podcast i'll see you soon